And I looked at a person and suddenly I saw a flame of fire over them. And it, it hovered about six inches over their head, but it was a flame and then all over it were lots of little flames. And I remember thinking, I wonder if this is what it was on the, on the day of Pentecost where it says that there were flames over them. Yeah. So during, during one of the visitations, the, the Lord told me, I didn't ask for it. He just said, he said, I'm going to allow you a tour of heaven. And, uh, <laughs> and I said, and I pulled back. I said, hold it. I said, is this a round trip? The way he said, yes, it's a round trip. So I said, okay, I'm good with that. I saw my angel's arm, just his forearm, like elbow forward. And he reached down and he said, take my hand. And suddenly I went zip, like right out of my body. I, I actually turned around to try to find the earth because we were flying through space. I saw inside the mind of the Lord and saw that he was indeed the creator. We started to slow down. I could, I could feel that deacceleration. And then I looked and there was a huge, huge city, huge city. Hi, welcome to Touching the Afterlife. This is Julie Erickson, and today I have with me John. John has had an incredible tour of heaven. He was taken there and was able to see so many things, including neighborhoods, people, family members, really cool stories, and yes, even pets, as well as the throne room of God. Wait till you hear these remarkable, incredible stories that will never, ever leave your mind. Trust me. So John, thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. Looking yes. forward to it. Thank you. I'm. We are too. And I just love what, all that you've shared in your testimony. And I'm excited for you to share with us today. So, can you just start, John, with uh, your your growing up years? Sure, sure. Happy to. You know, I'm the oldest of four kids, and I, it was a good life up to the point that my dad left the family. And I'm the oldest of four, meaning that we were eleven nine, seven, and five, when he sat us down on his birthday, on his birthday, and told us that he and mom were getting divorced. And my little five-year-old sister didn't understand that because in our circle of friends, we didn't know anybody who was divorced. And uh, and so she, she just asked the question, what does that mean? And my dad wasn't trying to be cruel, but it came across cruel. You know how, how it is as a parent. Sometimes you say things and it, it, it's heard in a different way. And so what he said was, he said, I'm divorcing your mother. I'm divorcing you kids. There won't be any birthdays, holidays, Christmas, ball games. I won't be there. And that phrase, I'm divorcing your mother. I'm divorcing you kids, hit each of us in a different way. Uh, my Today, you know, today, I, I, my dad could pick up the phone and, and we'd pick up where he left off. But uh at that time, it suddenly left a vacuum in my life. When he left and married the other woman, he had promised to raise her two children as his own. And he kept his promise, even though we were just 20 minutes across town, built a nice house, all that stuff, and, and really ignored the four of us. And so I had to grow up very quick. I was 11 years old and the oldest, and mom was suddenly alone with a, you know, a big house. And so I had to we had three acres of land, so I had to, to mow it, and I had to sometimes babysit my brothers and sister. My, my mom went back to school, uh, finished her master's degree, and worked and studied out of the home as much as she could. Uh, it was just really, really tough. It was just like just like the rug pulled out from under you, just, just totally upended. Because up to that point, my dad, I, I still to this day, I, I cherish the things he taught me. You know, he taught me you know, my dad was a business owner, so he was kind of prepping me to either take over the business or, or be successful. So he taught me how to shake hands, taught me how to polish shoes, taught me how to look someone in the eye, taught me how to, the rule I still live by today, whenever you rent or borrow a place, leave it in at least as good a shape as you had it and received it, or in better shape if you have the opportunity. And my dad taught me all kinds of things like that. So when he, he, he just said, I'm divorcing your mother, I'm divorcing you kids. It pulled the rug out. And so that absence of my father suddenly caused me to look for a dad, to look for mm -hmm. a father. And so for the next four years, I I went through, a, I, I had a, a negative self-image like a lot of kids. I think all four of us uh, children at the time took on us a, a certain amount of blame thinking, you know, if I wasn't here, mom and dad would still be together. You know how kids are. They don't understand adults things. 
And so you, you, I remember talking to my little brothers and my little sister, you know, if we, if we weren't here, mom and dad would still be together. Should we run away? What should we do? Mm-hmm. It, I, I was big for my age, uh, a little chunky at the time. And, and so I had a, a really horrible self-image because I thought, you know, my dad rejected me. So, you know, who am I? To, you know, he, he doesn't want me, so I don't want me. And so as a result, I dropped out over the next year or so. I dropped out of everything. I dropped out of scouts. I dropped out of later in, in my teenage years, I would take scuba lessons and flying lessons and art lessons and, and music lessons and all of those things. And just I gradually dropped out. I flunked the first semester of algebra as a ninth grader because I just really didn't care. I had a, a complete apathy for life. It was just totally gone. And yet on the inside, I was searching. I was searching for a father, for a dad. And one of the reasons I dropped out was because, like in Scouts, all the other friends had their dad with them. And mm-hmm. I was the only kid without a dad present. And mm-hmm. it was it was like that in everything. Ball games, when I played baseball, you know, during the summer, all of that thing, dad would never show up. He, he'd break promises. You know, my little brother and I stopped counting it at about 23 different broken promises. You know, I'm going to be there at your ball game today. I'm going to sneak away from the office. I'm going to I'm going to go to your ball game, and he never show up. You know, I'm going to get you. Be ready at four o'clock after school. I'm going to take you all for some ice cream. He would never show up. So that all contributed to just an apathy towards life and a horrible self image. And the Father God, looking back on it, the Father God was good. And this is what I encourage anybody who's been in a similar situation like that: go back and look at some of the good things that did happen to you. Because some of my friends, my guy friends who were my age, their dads did their best to include me. You know, one friend uh, who I found out later was a Christian, uh, but they included me when they went on a, uh, a weekend to go skiing. And I learned how to snow ski at that time. Mm-hmm. Another one w- invited me because my friend, his son was my friend, but they'd include me going up to the Summer Lake Cottage. And, uh, you know, things of that nature where different men were given to me throughout the next four years as examples of men in my life, but not a single one of them was my own father. And so I was in German class in high school, uh, 10th grade, and a a girl named Janie, Janice, but she goes by Janie, and we're, we're, Barb and I are really good friends with her today. Her boyfriend, Vic, who's now in heaven, uh, boyfriend and future husband, uh, led her to the Lord. And then she led me to the Lord in German class in 10th grade high school. And then I led Barb, my, my girlfriend to the Lord. And when I met the Lord, this is the thing, Julie, this is the thing. When I met the Lord, I wasn't as concerned about Jesus. He wasn't my focus. I was running straight to the father Mm. because that was my heart as a, as a young teenager, you know, between 11 and, and at that point, 16 years old, when I accepted the Lord and believed on him. Well, I that was a Jan- huge need for you. That was a huge need in that time. Having it was, a father. And, and, you know, my, because I'm, I'm big, I'm, I'm like six, six, I may have shrunk a little bit, six, five now, but mm-hmm. you know, I'm six, six. And my mother apologized to me when I was about 18. She said, you were just so big. I apologize to you. I treated you like you were an adult. I treated you like you were 17 or 18 years old. And now that you're 18, I realize I did that to you, put all that pressure on you. And she apologized to me. Mm-hmm. And the, and, but it helped me. The Father God helped me. It, it, when Janie led me to the Lord, I, I remember standing in my bedroom and I, and I said, Jesus, if you're going to have the last word on my life, and you're going to set the record straight and everything that, it, and you've got the last word. It only makes sense to serve you now. And it was on that basis that I said, Jesus, I give you my heart. But once I did that, I ran straight to the Father. You know, in in the Gospel of John, in chapter 14 and verse six, Jesus said, "I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me." That indicates that while Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. Our destination is the Father. No one comes to the Father but by me. So Jesus is the way, but the Father is our destination. And Mm -hmm. I ran straight to the Father. And so many Christians today find themselves powerless and actually incomplete and thinking there must be something more because they don't know the Father, because maybe they have um, an Old Testament image of the Father or something of that nature, or they've transferred a, a, Mm -hmm. a bad or evil or absent earth dad 
to their heavenly father and they can't reconcile mm -hmm. kind and sweet Jesus, how they see him versus God. The father is the authoritative, you know, the, the one with the paddle in his hand or the baseball bat ready to bean you over the head. Mm -hmm. And they can't reconcile that. Of course, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. Jesus revealed the father. Now, the opening words of the gospel of John tell, uh, tell us uh, in about verse 18 that the law came by Moses but the Father, but he revealed the Father, but Jesus revealed the Father. So the law came by Moses, but Jesus revealed the Father. And so that's, that Father is the one that I got to know. And I just started talking to the Father exclusively. I, I could mm -hmm. see in the New Testament, every single prayer was to the Father. From the mm -hmm. Lord's Prayer onward, every single prayer request was to the Father. And, and so as a result of that, growing up, you know, we had two or three acres of land and the, the lawnmower would break. And I'd say, Father, how can I fix this? And I would start listening down on the inside of me for solutions, for wisdom, for ideas to float up. And it was, I was being led by the Spirit before I really knew it. But I, I, I just developed this, this um, discipline of, of checking on the inside of me. When I would talk to the Father, my, my attention would shift to, to the inside of me to sense if I was I was sensing any peace or direction or or words or or anything. And so I, I would say, Father, how do I fix this lawnmower? And then I'd stop and listen and kind of pray and look on the inside. And, and pretty soon this idea would come up or I'd I'd hear something. It would sometimes it would start out very vague. And the more I gave myself to it, the the details would emerge. And there's I, a uh, I just have to say I love that, John. I love that you know, when we seek him in little things, he's faithful to answer. Your father was there to answer your needs, small and big. He was, he was truly my father growing yeah. up. And so because of that, when I read the book of Acts, I thought that was normal Christianity. I mean, there's, there's Peter in Acts chapter four, praying to, to God, the father, the creator of everything, stretch forth your hand to heal by the name of your holy child, Jesus. You know, and the place was shaken and, and miracles were done. I thought that's normal Christianity. You talk to the Father, you lay hands on the sick, you cast out demons, you people see angels. Uh, a man named Ananias saw Jesus. The Apostle Paul saw Jesus uh, multiple times. Uh, you know, you just, I just grew up thinking that's normal. And so when I was about 16 or 17, the Father told me, he said, I've called you to be a seer. I didn't know what that was. You know, we're, we're, told that in 1 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 9, that a seer is an old word for the word prophet. But they were called seers because their, they were, their eyes were open up. They were entrusted with seeing sometimes in the spirit realm. Mm. And, and so I, I still, I didn't know what that meant. And nothing much really <laughs> happened until uh, I was about, what, 26 years old or something like that. So, um but the desire was, I didn't seek it. That's the thing, Julie. I never sought to see Jesus. I never sought to see angels. I never sought an experience other than the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But I never sought an experience. I just thought it's normal, so it ought to be happening. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a form of faith, actually. <laughs> you had faith it was going to happen. Yeah, um, I did reach a place uh, when I was uh, about 22. I guess I would have been, yeah, about 22 where I said, where nothing had been happening, you know, he's, he's you know, all, all this stuff, all the things that I thought of the book of Acts being normal Christianity. And I had seen some people healed here and there, you know, prayer meetings and stuff like that, minor miracle type stuff. But I got to a place in 1980 where I just said, okay, Father, if, if, um, if I never see you, never see the Lord, never see an angel, uh, things of that nature, that's okay. Uh, and I meant it. I, I, I mean, I wrestled for two or three months within myself. and I. But finally, I got to the point, I said, okay, you know what? I know I'm going to heaven, and I'll see you in heaven. And if nothing ever happens, then that's fine with me. If the book of Acts never appears normal in my life, then that's okay with me. I'll, I, I don't, I, I'll trust you just based on the word, based on what I know of you. And I was 22 or so when that happened. That was in, in uh, late 1980. And it was like that for six years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I started out, I, I became an associate pastor in an unpaid position, but it was an associate pastor. And on Monday afternoons, I held what, what we called healing school. And from 1 to 3 p.m. at the church, uh, 15 or 20 people would gather and I would teach them things that the Lord had taught me about healing. 
And uh, it, in fact, I've got healing school as one of the uh, one of the things in our website that people can still get today. <laughs> it's funny because it was recorded on audio tape and, and so it transferred to digital. So my voice sounds like I've been sucking on helium. But um, but some of the lessons from that are still today. They're applicable and everything. And I start teaching. So I would be sitting there, Julian, there'd be there'd be 15 or 20 people in an oval around I me, mean, kind of a big circle. And I looked at a person and suddenly I saw a flame of fire over them and it, it hovered about six inches over their head. Mm. And it was like a huge, like imagine an upside down Valentine's heart or maybe an aspen leaf or cottonwood. If folks are familiar with the kind of a heart shaped leaf and the base was, you know, the wider part and then it went up, but it was a flame. And then all over it were lots of little flames. And I remember thinking, I wonder if this is what it was on the on the day of Pentecost, where it says that there were flames over them. And I would look at that person, I'd see those flames, and then I would start getting words of knowledge and words of wisdom about them, and, I, and prophetic words, and I would just get deliver them. And sometimes on other people, I would see a shaft of light. It would just come through the ceiling, and they would encase them in a round circle of light. And then I, I saw like the Father's words, just like printed out. I'd see it come down that shaft and into their spirit, and I would just read. I would just read to them. I said, this is what the Father said to you. And I would just read to them. And, and sometimes they'd be like in a trance and they'd be frozen for a half an hour where they wouldn't move at all. A trance being when, you're, when your physical senses, your physical uh, body is suspended for a time so the Father can put things in your spirit. Mm -hmm. So you can bypass your mind and your body. And uh, Paul talked about being in a, in a trance and seeing uh, the Lord. And, and Peter was in a trance when he saw the, the sheet let down uh, in Acts chapter uh, 10. Is this the seer gift coming to play now? I, I assume so, but at the same time, there's lots of lots of people who have had similar things. I, I've seen people have, uh, have those experiences. I think the only part that may be the seer part is actually being able to see into the spirit realm to see what is going on kind of behind the scenes. But but I but the Lord can do that with anyone at any time, because that uh, that opening of my eyes to His realm is I think under the category of visions, uh, spiritual dreams, the discerning of spirits. It's it's all a manifestation of the Holy Spirit that He can function with it, anybody at any time. What I found is because we've got the Holy Spirit, He will manifest Himself according to what the situation calls for. Okay. It's, you know, so in, so it's more. Sometimes people say, "I, I want to be," you know, "I want the Lord to use me for healing." Well, mm -hmm. you have to be put in a position where that person needs healing, and there is no no other means. Um, it's kind of like we talked to some. I talked to some good friends who were missionaries in Panama, mm -hmm. down in the Choco, down in the Darien jungle where the Choco Indians live. And the miracles that they had in their lives were just like reading the book of Acts. I mean, people raised from the dead and the food multiplied and all of that. And I asked them about it and they said, well, you have to understand either God does a miracle or they die. They said, it's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, they explained it's not like everywhere else where if God doesn't do a miracle. You can go to the doctor. You can have a surgery. You can run to the pharmacy. They said in the primitive areas where we were, God does a miracle or, or they die. And the primary purpose for miracles is a, is to confirm the testimony of Jesus Christ. Mm. And so and so they had a lot of things happen. So if somebody says, I want, I want that in my life, well, you better go someplace that is that needy to, uh, because the Lord is more inclined to to help a person out. And that There's person no can be there. <laughs> yeah. And, and 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 but there's so many people in the prayer lines, you know, come up and they mm. say, Okay, this doesn't work. I'm headed to the doctor on Tuesday. Right. You know, that it's like you're not going to receive <laughs> very much. Wow. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Wow. That's incredible. So did that lead into shortly after? Tell us about now when gearing up to go to heaven, which we're excited okay. to hear. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll fast forward a little bit. So during that time frame, I was doing the healing schools uh, at that church. It was in that time frame in, in April of 1986 where the Lord first appeared to me. And then he appeared again, which was the most, remains the most life-changing visitation I had with him was on October 1st of 1986. And that's when the Lord appeared to me and taught me how the Father communicates, taught me uh, how, to, how to 
use my mind as kind of the middle point of the teeter-totter, which we all do naturally. You know, you've got your spirit on one side and your physical body on the other, and there's your mind in the middle. And and everybody knows this. It's it's like, let's say it's Sunday morning and you you want to get up and go to church, but then you're tired, you need a day to sleep in. So your mind is in the middle. Your body is telling you, sleep in, you need the rest. But your spirit is over here going, I'm hungry. I need the worship. I need the teaching. Mm-hmm. So if your soul and your body agree with each other, you'll you'll keep in bed and your spirit will go unfed. But if your spirit and your soul agree, you'll drag your body out of bed. You'll make it get in the shower and you'll make it get in the car and, and get going to church. So the Lord taught me about that, about always shifting my attention to and he gave scriptural examples in his own life uh, about about uh, being aware spiritually what was happening instead of just physically. He gave several examples in his own life, um, like in Luke eight forty six, when everyone was pressing him and touching him, and yet he felt uh, healing power go out of him. And he was talking to me about how he he was aware spiritually of what was going on, even though his physical senses were firing off because everyone was reaching him and grabbing him. And then the woman, you know, with the with the hemorrhaging issue, touched the hem of his garment. And he he sensed that that healing power go out of him. So he taught me about that. Years years later, you're asking about about heaven. Um, years later, well, I'll, I'll say this: that over the next three four years, when our kids were younger, they would go to sleep early, and Barb and I would pray and we would worship, mm-hmm. and just that's what we did. Um, you know, I would usually assume the position of being on the floor, uh, forehead down, knees, you know, just 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 worshiping, palms up, just worshiping. And I learned how to be in the spirit then. I learned how to quiet my mind and yeah. worship in the spirit and get to the point where I was so involved in the worship that I lost track of time, lost track of who I, who, where I was. Mm. Some, some, some people may relate to that, be able to, you know, Sometimes you can worship and you can do that and you can think, okay, while I'm worshiping and seeing how much I love the Lord, I'm thinking, uh, did I turn the stove off before we left the house? You know, but there's a point that you exhaust all those things and you focus and you listen to yourself worship. You listen to yourself uh, worship in tongues. You're baptized with the spirit. You're, you listen to yourself in all that. And you you are aware of what's come up out of your spirit and you just lose track of the physical. Wow. And and can those- I just say, John, don't you think that sometimes people give up too soon and they don't get to that place. Cause I know for me many times over, I, I'm not feeling it. So I'm just going to go tend to my laundry, you know? <laughs> I, I, I actually, I don't know if that's the, the logical part of me, the scientific part, but I actually tracked it at, at the first time where I got what, what the apostle John calls in the spirit. And he uses that terms twice in revelation one ten. He said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And then in Revelation 4, 2, he said, I was in the spirit and I heard a, and I saw a door open in heaven and I heard a voice saying, come up here mm-hmm. in the spirit. And so I'd only heard one other minister talk about being in the spirit and how you could pray to the point that you, that you could be in the spirit. You could uh, focus so much on spiritual things that you'd lose track of, of the, of the natural senses. And so you're right. The first time I timed it, and it, it took me 50 minutes, five zero. It took me 50 minutes wow. to get to the point where I'd gone through, uh, you know, did Barb make the kids uh, lunch for school tomorrow? Is is Did I remember to fix the toilet so it doesn't run anymore? Um, oh, do, do we have firewood outside? Because I want to do the wood stove in the morning. It's going to be cold. You work through all of these, and you pull yourself back. You know, you know how it is. You pull yourself back. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Shout to the Lord. Yay, Jose. Yeah, Santa. You know, all the different stuff. And then your, your mind drifts and you pull it back. And it took 50 minutes. And then later I I, I disciplined myself just to reject all those external thoughts uh, that would come in. And then I, I looked at my watch another time and it was uh, it was 10 minutes. And I and from that point now, it's I can almost I've trained myself enough. I mean, that was so long ago. Uh, I've trained myself enough that I can now just start worshiping and, and be in the spirit. But you can you can tell. I mean, it, in your average service or like with us where we do, we're a house church network, and you can tell that if the CD stops or the the, the Bluetooth or the you know the the playlist stops or the guitar stops or whatever, 
And you can tell who's used to worshiping because they will continue to worship because the stoppage of the music doesn't mean anything to them. They're so caught up in worship. Mm -hmm. And other people, when the music stops, they stop. And that tells me you don't know how to worship. You're not worshiping out of your heart. You may be worshiping out of the mind, but it's out of the spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you know, Julie, it's, it, in John 4, 24, where Jesus said that God the Father is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Uh, in the spirit means from your spirit, and in truth means without ulterior motives. So you have to work through the idea of attaching something to your worship. I'm worshiping because I have a bill that needs paid on Friday, and I'm reminding you to don't set this on the back burner. Please move it to a top priority. I'm worshiping you, but I'm doing it with attaching my need. Mm, or we go to or we go to Wednesday night service because we wouldn't normally go, but I'm going to remind you, Lord, that I have this need later in the week. Jesus said you have to worship out of spirit, and that is out of your spirit and in truth, which means no ulterior motive. And the word worship. In the Greek language uh, is pros kaneo. Pros means towards and kaneo means kiss. So mm. worship is actually kissing God in a covenant kiss from your heart saying, I love you. I, you know, I, I, I worship you. I appreciate you in my life. It's from the heart and it's that, that affection to mm. him. So you can't do that out of your head only. You can start in your head, but pretty soon you get to, if I didn't, if I didn't have you in my life, I would be six feet under. You know, I would be in prison. I would be so lost, you know. So you have to learn to, and, and it, 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 trust me, it's by repetition. It's, it's uh, Hebrews 5.14. Hebrews 5.14 says that strong meat is for those who by reason of use have trained their senses to discern between good and evil, have trained yeah. their senses by reason of use. It's, it's trial and error. And like I said, I timed it, you know, 50 minutes down to 10 before I'd be in the spirit. And I think that's why busyness and distractions is a huge factor in why we don't reach that. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you're asking about about heaven. Yeah. So during during one of the visitations, the, the Lord told me, and I didn't ask for it. He just said, he said, I'm going to allow you a tour of heaven. And <laughs> there's a there's an angel that's that I call my angel that's usually I, I don't know how to say it, except that the doctrine that where Jesus said about the little children, that their angels always behold the face of the father and the Jewish belief that each person has a guardian angel, uh, that Jewish belief that Jesus would have grown up with, Paul would have grown up with, et cetera. I, I know to be true from what I've seen. Uh, and so there is that angel that that in fact, when I when Jesus first introduced him, uh, if you will, he. I recognized the angel's voice. And then he gave me two or three instances in my life where I had heard a voice from outside of me tell me to do something. The first was when I was 14, and, and I debated whether to put the helmet on to go ride my mini bike or not. And I heard this voice saying, go ahead and obey your mom and put on your helmet. And mm -hmm. I took that thought. I took that like a thought from the outside, and I took it as my own. I said, I think I'll obey mom and put on my helmet. Well, that helmet saved my life. I had a wreck later that day, and that helmet saved my life. But it wasn't until later I recognized it came from behind me and from the outside, and that was that angel uh, that the Lord was standing there, and, and I, I recognized his voice. And he could, gave me a couple other instances in my life that he had that I'd suddenly had the strong, like almost outside word coming in to do something or not do something, and I recognized it. And I think a lot of people have had those types of experiences where they feel someone in the room and they're, they're like telling them not to do something. And you take it as a suggestion. It, it's always with peace, but it's all, and it's almost like a suggestion. It's just like a neutral thought. But, yeah. but anyway, so the first time it happened, I was, I was praying and actually he, he, this angel started to take me. He said, he said, now's the time for your tour of heaven. And, uh, <laughs> and I said, and I pulled back, I said, hold it. I said, is this a round trip? <laughs> it never, I, I never stopped to, to ask the Lord to make sure it's a round trip. I'm married. I've got three boys. One of them is handicapped. You know, had the cord around his neck in a slip knot when he was born and some brain damage. And so I can't leave Barb with the three boys. And so I, I, I held off for three weeks uh, because in, in that time, the Lord came and taught me some other things. And he said, and he said, by the way, he said, yes, it's a round trip. So I said, okay, I'm good with that. So, so a few days later, I was in the church praying. I, I was kneeling. I was a pastor of a church at that time, 
And I was kneeling in the sanctuary. I had my hands up. And suddenly I, I opened my eyes. I looked up and there, I saw my angel's arm, just his forearm, like elbow forward. And he reached down and he said, take my hand. And when I did that, I saw my spirit man's hand. I saw the my, my forearm, my spirit man's hand come up out of my physical hand and arm and grab a hold of his hand. And suddenly I went zip like right out of my body. Uh, you know, Paul writes about that in 2 Corinthians 12. He said, I knew a man who was caught up into paradise, into the third heaven, which is where God lives. And he said, whether in the body or out, I don't know. Hmm. That's Sometimes that's the way things happen. You, you're not sure uh, if you're in the body or out, but this I definitely knew. I would have been, if you were to look at it, you were to step in, you would have seen John uh, kneeling there in the church with his hands up. And you would have said, okay, I won't bother him. Physically, biblically, it would have been described as a trance mm -hmm. because I was just there physically, but in my spirit and soul, I was I was taken to heaven. That also yeah. reminds me of Lester Summerall's story, if you're familiar with that. No. Huh? Okay. He had the same type of thing, but he wasn't shown heaven. He was shown hell. Uh, anyway. I, I got to know him just about just a few months before he before he died. He was a speaker at a chapel where I was the director of the Bible school. Yeah, he actually, he was the one who said, he told me, he said, he said, you remember the story of Smith Wigglesworth and the young man, the 17 year old who came to his door with a newspaper under his arm? Yes. And he, said, he said, that was me. <laughs> and and I said, well, I kind of understood that, but uh, he, he also, he also had some good, good wisdom uh, yeah. in, in a lot of areas. But anyway, Go ahead. Sorry. I just thought we No, no, that's, that's a good rabbit trail. Where, uh, where the angel and I, where, where we came, I, I, I actually turned around to try to find the earth because we were flying through space. And it was the second time, the first time was with the Lord, where I looked in his eyes and it was like I was pulled into like all the universe. And I, I saw inside the mind of the Lord and saw that he was indeed the creator. Mm. And it was like I was in the spirit with him and I saw all the stars and all the, the galaxies and everything else. And I just came away that, wow, you are the creator. But this was a little different. This was like I was flying through space in that I looked for the earth. I turned around to try to find the earth and I couldn't find it. I couldn't find the sun. I, I thought, wow, this is not like in the movies. This is you don't get closer to the stars, the distances that I see here on earth. Somehow I always thought if I were to fly through space, I could actually get closer to some of the stars, but the distances are so vast. You, you don't feel like you're getting any closer to anything. And we started to slow down. I could, I could feel that deacceleration. And then I looked and there was a huge, huge city walls, maybe 20 stories tall and, you know, stone block walls, but they were pure white and big blocks. And, and we were coming up from kind of beneath it, and there were gates every, what I gather was about 300 miles. Um, one of the things I learned there is heaven is larger on the inside than it is on the outside. And that sounds very, very strange. Uh, our mm -hmm. mind just goes tilt. And mm -hmm. the best way I can describe it is that Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a seed. And so most, most everybody would be familiar with a seed, you know, apple seed cherry seed, peach pit, avocado, whatever the case is, there's a seed. And you have to ask yourself of that apple seed, how many apple trees are in that single seed? How many apples are within that seed? If you plant that seed, it grows up to a tree. It has, you know, 100 apples per season, each one with half a dozen seeds. So in that one seed, it's larger on the inside than it is on the outside. And that's the way you and I are. We have dreams, we have talents, we have gifts, we have things that in this short lifetime, we'll never be able to touch. We won't be able to do it. And, and, and now at my age, in the mid-60s here, you know, there are things I'd love to do, but I, I realize it's going to have to be a couple hundred years from now. It'll have to be 500 years from now. There are gifts and talents and things that I want to explore that I've learned about myself that God put in me. But I'm mm -hmm. I'm larger on the inside than on the outside. Then my life reflects on the outside. You're you are larger on the inside. You know, mm -hmm. a, a young girl, a young boy, they they dream of finding a mate and having babies and maybe starting a business, going to school. Their dreams indicate they are larger on the inside than they are on the outside. Oh wow. So when you're coming up to heaven and seeing all the people who have ever lived who are in heaven over all the time, and you you look at the Bible description of it being in the book of Revelation, being like 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles, kind of a giant square or something, 
it's it's larger than that. It's 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 like almost multi-dimensional. But um, but I we, we flew over and then landed in the in the grass. And when flying over, what struck me was the architecture that there was architecture from all over the world, and and there were homes like normal homes. One of them that was most amazing were like the row houses you see in Philadelphia or New York, where they have the same exact steps up and front door, you know, and, and they're right next to each other practically, you know, like um, long houses. And, and you see this in England as well, where the houses are narrow, but they're long and they're all attached to one another. So lots of those. Um, but the biggest thing, the biggest thing to me was the relationships going on. They're, they're for instance, <laughs> I could take, I could talk your ear off, but but in talking about the relationships, there were a, a li- there was a little girl and a little boy sitting under a tree, mm. and the little boy was crawling around. So he was probably a year or so old, and and then the girl was four, six, eight years old, somewhere in the or, uh, six or eight, something like that. And around them, this standing around the tree where they were, she was se- seated with her back against the tree, and there were. 14 people, I counted them, 14 adults around them. And I knew them by the spirit. I knew them to be aunts and uncles and grandparents and great-grandparents, extended family. And we walked by and they were just talking. And the little girl was playing with her brother. And I said, where's the parents? I said, we're missing a generation. Where are the parents? And the angel said, he said, oh, these, these children died in a car accident. And he said, their parents survived. They're on the earth. And he said, where, where possible, children are raised by, by family. And I said, I need chapter and verse on that. I, I've never seen that. And he said, have you not read Ephesians 3, 14, 15, where Paul said he bows his knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven is named? He said, there is but one family, and it doesn't matter whether they're in heaven or earth. It's one family in Jesus. And I just went like, Wow. You know, I just, it's like suddenly it, it made sense. And, you know, I, I saw in, a, in another another setting, there was a, a man and his dad, and they were talking through things. And I actually, this was a man who was part of one of our house churches. Uh, and I had got to meet him about a year or so before he died. I knew that he had grown up on a family ranch that had been homesteaded. And I knew that in his lifespan, they were, because his children were not interested in maintaining the ranch, that he had to sell it off. And he felt horrible about it. He felt like he was letting down his his ancestors, his relatives. And he had a heart attack and died. He was in his early 60s, I think. So anyway, I saw this man and I, I didn't I didn't talk to him or anything like that. But I saw him and I saw who, the man who I knew to be his dad. And I didn't know his dad on the earth. His dad is long gone, I'm sure. But they were walking along a bank of, of what I assume was the river of life because the river was flowing one way and they were walking along the bank and they were talking. So I asked the angel, I said, I, you know, I recognize him. I said, uh, I said, what are they talking about? And he said, it's none of your business. But what I can tell you is that it had to do with a fight, excuse me, with an argument they had and a, a big fight that led to him leaving the home when he was 17 years old. And they're working it. They're working it out. That that realization that life continues, that heaven is a transition. It's so normal, and and you can see in scripture, Julie. You can see that in scripture when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he did not lose any of his memory. He did not lose any of his his knowledge of what had happened before. He talked to the guys. He said, "Remember when I was with you? I told you these things." And mm. And so there's there's nothing that's lost in Christ. What we have in heaven, though, is you don't have a devil. You don't have the human flesh. And here's the good thing about it. You have the Holy Spirit so saturating everything that anything that is that you intend to say to someone is perfectly communicated by revelation and by understanding to the other person. So there's no possibility of of mistaking what they're trying to say there's no there's no chance of taking it wrong you are given the full understanding you whatever their heart is to explain themselves you immediately hear their heart see their heart you know exactly where they're coming from so the reconciliation is seamless the reconciliation of working through things is seamless and 
you know, I, I go back to Jesus at his resurrection and talking to the disciples. And he started with chapter and verse. He started with Moses and, and, and the prophets and explained about how he had to die and how, he, you know, he had to talk through it all. And he gave them understanding. It says in Luke 24 and then in Acts 1, by the Spirit, he, he opened their understanding. That's the way it is in heaven. I love that. So because we're fully in the spirit and not in the flesh anymore, none of those things get in the way that happens here on earth. Exactly. Wow. And and that's that's one of the most remarkable things. There was there was a there was a I talk about life being normal. There was a a woman who um well, I was walking by and there was a nice little uh two-story house like you'd find oh, 100 years ago in the United States and still exist in older neighborhoods today where it's got a front porch on the, on the front and it kind of wraps around the side and it's a covered porch. And it's, it was a tall, like a two-story, uh, almost like a Victorian style uh, two-story house, a smaller, small house, but, but it, was, it was very neat and very tidy and very pretty. And we're walking by and there was, there was this path that led to the back and I could see in the back what looked like a mud hut. And I thought, that's interesting. And I, I said, can we go back here? I, I'm curious. And so we walked back and out from this hut comes a woman. And she explained that she was from Kenya. And she looked like a Kenyan woman who lived in a rural part. And that house that she lived in that was uh, like mud and sticks and straw and everything else is like I've seen in so many nature shows and, and traveling shows and things of that nature. And, but very primitive, but she came out from there and she said, I grew up in Kenya, in a rural part of Kenya. And she said, but I had seen those pretty American homes. And I said to myself, I would, I, I would love to have, I would like to, to have one of those one day. I would love to have one of those. She said, it was just a heart's desire. But of course, where I was, there was no possibility of that happening. And she said, I just had it in my heart that I always thought that would be a pretty house to have and everything. She said, when I died and came to heaven, because I am familiar with this, this is what's comfortable to me in my house like I grew up in and like I lived in. But the father was so gracious, he also gave me the house of my desire. And she said, and I go there to the house and she said, I'll sit on the porch and I'll talk to people as they walk by and visit with people and invite people in. And mm -hmm. he said, and she said, so the father is very gracious in that way. And I, I, that just blew my mind. I, I just, that, that right. remains one of the more cherry, cherished memories of that visit to heaven. Tell us about your, that's, I love that story. And I love, uh, tell us a little bit about the pets and you had a pet monkey. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, at the beginning, I talked about how, you know, with my dad leaving that I was searching for a father back in the day, you, you're talking, you know, 1971, 72, 73 in the United States, you could buy monkeys at the pet store. And this was a pet store in the local mall. And a little, I bought a little squirrel monkey. And a squirrel monkey is from South America. It can't wrap its tail around anything. It doesn't have a prehensile tail. But it's about, you know, 10 or 12 inches tall, cute little face. And I think my mother knew that I needed something to nurture mm -hmm. or to be nurtured more. I don't know. I was a 14-year-old boy, you know, going through puberty without a dad, the oldest of four, and all the responsibility of mowing and maintaining and corralling my brothers and sister. And, all the responsibility that I felt. And so I got this monkey. I named her Tilly. She was the smallest one of the group uh, of three or four that were in that cage. And she kind of clung to the others. And I and, and there's something in my heart I wanted to, to nurture her. So brought her home, named her Tilly. She became my best little pal. She had a little harness. I had a neighbor who built a, a big cage, four feet by four feet. And she was in the family room. I potty trained her. Uh, to to go to the cage and the you know just change the newspapers daily. She we would go outside of the house with her little harness and she would eat bugs at night that would come up to the porch lights and stuff like that. And she died about a year later on my lap on the way to the vet. She she just one day she was just curled up and wasn't her normal self. And it turned out she had a bowel. The veterinarian later said she had a bowel obstruction and was probably uh, born that way. And that's why she was smaller than the others. And so that was, I was 14. And so when I was 15 is when she died. Uh, so I had her for about a year. So when I was born again, a year later or so, I went to where I buried her outside the, the back door. And I stood over her grave 
and I felt kind of foolish because it was just me and it was like, nobody's around, you know? And I said, father, I said, I don't know how you do it, but if it's possible, I'd like Tilly to be in heaven. Elijah was carried away by a chariot pulled by horses and Jesus is coming back with all the saints on horseback. So if there are horses in heaven, why not monkeys? Mm. And so you can make, I said, I don't know if it's going to be an exact duplicate or if it's her, I don't know, you know, how that works, but if you could just make her in heaven, I'd appreciate it. Amen. You know, that, that was it. So here I am years later, we, the angel and I land after ob- observing all this architecture and stuff, we land in this grass. There's a wall, a low wall to my right with kind of the city to my right. And before me was just open space, grass and hills and, and uh, forest and and just trees. It was it was pretty amazing. Um, but anyway, so I'm standing there and I see this. The grass is tall. There's this the river of life, which is you know 50 feet or so across, and the grass grows right down to its bank. And the grass is a, 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 almost two feet tall. Maybe it's a tall, uh, like you've seen pictures sometimes in England where the grass will go right down into to the stream. There's no muddy bank. It's just grows right to to the water and coming through i could see the tops of the grass rustling in the top of an animal but i didn't know what it was and then suddenly there at the water's edge as she leaped over in one leap leaped over the river was our pet golden retriever abby who had died in 1989 january 3rd of 1989 was hit by the school bus such a traumatic event to our three young boys and to my wife and so Mm -hmm. unexpected because abby was like you know the, the, the the she was part of the family Mm. and there was Abby, and there was Tilly, my monkey, on Abby's back. So it was interesting because here is Tilly from my childhood and Abby from my life right then, because this is only a year or so, uh, a few months after Abby had died, and they're together. So it tells me that the father connects those time and space. Just Mm. like I said, Tilly was when I was a teenager, now I married three kids, and Abby was there. So... They jumped, Abby jumped over the river and sat down and looked at me, kind of the golden retriever kind of face and tongue hanging out, not because she was hot or, or out of breath or anything like that. She just looked up at me to that kind of look that she had on her face. And I heard her thoughts, again, by the Holy Spirit, what we would call a word of knowledge on the earth, a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. She looked up at me and she thought, where's Barb and the boys? Mm. And I was startled. I, I looked at my angel like, my dog just talked to me. I was just, and he said, he said, when you're in heaven, you can take part of the father's unlimited knowledge as you have need because it's governed by love. Mm. And so I just looked back at her and I said, it's just me. They're, they're not here right now. It's just me. And she went, okay. And Tilly had had in that meantime, Tilly had leafed up on my shoulders and looked over the top of my head the way she used to do when I was a teenager. And, and it was so good to see her and everything. And then with that word, she jumped back on Abby and, they jumped over the river again and went off. And, yeah. and that's how I that's how I conclude my book, Pursuing the Seasons of God, which, you know, I tell people, if you mm-hmm. want to email me personally at C-W-O-W-I at AOL.com, uh, I'll be happy to send you the PDF of that, Pursuing the Seasons of God. That's I end with that event right there of, of heaven. But Pursuing the Seasons is uh, some of my earlier visitations with the Lord, more, much more detailed than uh, and several more than we could go into in, in our time here. They see W-O-W-I at AOL.com. Just email okay, me. and we will leave that link, John, and for our viewers to be able to sure. reach you for sure. Yeah. One more story, it keeps coming to mind. Can you share about the little girl and her hair? Ooh. The little girl that you saw. Yeah. So after the Abby left and everything, we the angel and I did one step and we stepped over that 50-foot length of, the river of life. The river of life, by the way, is remarkable. It made its own waves. It was happy. Each, it was almost, it was so full of life. Uh, every time I looked at, looked at it and like the waves that were breaking, it's like the waves were breaking for joy. They weren't breaking against the riverbank. They were just downstream, just going downstream, just like for joy. And every time I looked at it, I giggled, I giggled like a little school girl. I couldn't help. There was such joy just bubbling up. I had to look away because I just start giggling. And we we jumped over that. And I remember thinking I could have swum across. I could have walked across. I could have waded across. And I, it made me wonder if Jesus had not perhaps walked on water before in the, you know, Matthew 14, Mark 6, uh, because 
of the river of life. Just, I just, we jumped across it, but I just thought, you know, we, I could have played in it anyway. So as we're walking by fast forward, there's a, there's a low, what appears to be a brick school building and there are children because the angel had told me uh, that, that the children in school enjoy Abby and Tilly. And that kind of blew my mind right there that there's some sort of school, some sort of education going on. But then again, I thought, okay, what if you had some of the greatest teachers? You know, Isaac Newton was a, was a Christian. Uh, you know, so so many. What what if you had the Apostle Paul? What if, you know, you could sit down with Peter and say, tell me what it was like when you first met Jesus. You know, so so there's there would be adults and children present. But what I saw to go to that point was a bunch of children playing outside like you would find at recess almost it was almost like like they were at recess and they were just playing and there are all kinds of animals <laughs> you know when a little child plays and says something like let my let my pet turtle be in heaven lord or you know i pray that my cat will be in heaven yeah. I, I think the father answers that a lot of times because there are all kinds of animals mm-hmm. and i saw kids playing with with big animals things that i want to play with that i don't on earth it's not going to happen uh, mm-hmm. There was a giraffe. The, there were there was bears. There were there were lions and and uh, there was tiger literally, and kids were playing and they understood each other by the same way that I understood what Abby was asking of me. And there was communication back and forth. And there were balls that were being kicked and and played with and wrestling and just it was just like a normal schoolyard except every kind of animal, pets and former pets and wild animals that were no longer wild. Uh, it was just amazing. Wow. But but there were some kids that stood out, and two of those were a couple of little girls. One was about, you know, eight or ten, the other one maybe six. And and I and this one girl had the most beautiful honey-colored, just golden hair, thick and long, just below her shoulders. And and you know, it was it was just it was just thick and, and gorgeous. I mean, she stood out. And so when I went past, we're walking past, and I stopped and I said, said tell me about the those girls there they seem to be friends and and he said this he said he said these girls died of cancer in Houston Texas and and he said um and I said the the girl with the golden hair colored hair and he said her hair on earth was very important to her she re- she cherished her hair she knew it was thick and beautiful and like any little girl but that was the the most cherished thing to her but when she got treatment, when she received the treatment, all her hair fell out. And she was very brave, and she told people it didn't matter, it was okay. And this is what the angel said. He said, but your father realized she was just being brave. She was just putting on a brave face. Mm -hmm. So when she came to heaven, he made sure she had that luxurious hair back, and even more so, because it was so precious to her. And about that time, the girls started coming over to, you know, walked over to me because they must have known by the spirit that we we're, were talking about them. Mm-hmm. And, and the, and the other little girl said this, she said, she, she said, I, she said, I didn't know the Lord when I was, when I was in the hospital, she said, but, but people would come by volunteers and others would come by and they'd read Bible stories to me. And one day I just said, I want to know Jesus. I believe in Jesus. And she said, and so when I died, I came here. And I thought that was just so gracious of the Lord that sometimes we're trained so religiously, you know, to to pray a certain way or to do, you know, raise a hand, close your eyes, everybody pray together, whatever the case is. This was just a simple turn of the heart of that little girl. Mm -hmm. And the father's graciousness for the girl with the hair uh, Mm -hmm. was just remains very, very special. It certainly is. Ah, and I know you have so many more stories that you go more into detail, like you said, in the book that you're going to share, correct? That you have that yeah, people well, can read per- about. Pursuing is more about the is more about the uh, visitations than my trip to heaven. I have a separate okay. uh, series and stuff they can get what I saw in heaven. They can, okay. can do that separately once they go to our website. Yeah. Awesome. Perfect. Because I know you have a lot more to share. And we've just got a certain amount of time here, but can you just lastly go into before you returned, you saw the throne of God, correct? Yeah, the father, you know, who I've known since I was a, a teenager. And so the father's been the one I primarily have always dealt with and fellowship with. And, and certainly the Lord, obviously, obviously in his visitations with me and stuff like that. But the father's always been my heart. 
So uh, the first time that I went before the throne, um, yeah, it, it, I don't, I hardly know what to say. I was, I was off to the side, and I immediately just assumed the position. You know, I'm on my knees, my head down. I am just in worship. There was complete ease, complete comfort, complete peace there. It, it was no different. You know, I can feel the Father's presence. I can feel the presence of, of the Lord in me right now in my spirit. It's just like normal. It was just like a kid might feel normal coming to the Father's dinner table at home. You know, six o'clock dinner is served and, it, you know, but I, it's that same presence. But at the same time, it's the Father God. And uh, I remember looking down and and of course the 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 tile the the flooring before him is like glass and it's like squares and seemed to be kind of a slight bevel to it and because I'm looking down at it and the cherubs are around the throne and it was interesting that I had I had seen a cherub before and I don't have time to go into the detail there but the cherubs are multi-winged angelic creatures around the throne and they and the father is an oriental king the lord jesus is an oriental king and what i mean by that is if you will check into some history if you'll check into african and oriental asian history you'll find that their their officials were often carried around on a portable chair that the servants would hold on poles on their on their shoulders and they would carry that that emperor or that official around and you see this in many different cultures. That's the that's the way the cherubs deal with the father, carry the father. He's described in Ezekiel chapter one as coming towards the prophet Ezekiel, who's standing next to the river. He's in the spirit, and suddenly he sees these these cherubs coming, and they're like balls of fire as they transport the throne platform. And he describes the father and the rainbow around the throne. He describes all that in Ezekiel one. So, so anyway, <laughs> there's lots of people around. And just in worship, and it, but it's a place of ease. It's a place of, of comfort. It's 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 not intimidating. Other than in mind, it's like you're the Father, you're God. You you are worthy to be worshipped. It just comes up out of you. And, but suddenly, the Father turns to me and he looks, and he's got a beard, and and he's like Daniel describes him as the Ancient of Days in Daniel seven. And some of your people uh, listening may remember or can look up Daniel seven, the Ancient of Days, from about verse nine through thirteen or so. Uh, the, the the son of man comes to the ancient of days and receives the kingdom with no end. But he describes the ancient of days as having hair like wool, which is wavy and and white, and is, he's got a beard. And the father turns to me, he looks at me, I look up like this, you know, from my crouching, kneeling position, rather kneeling position, and I he looks at me and he says, I'll be back. And with that, the cherubs, their wings started flapping. And there was like an iridescent dust. It was like... Um, I don't know how to describe it other than an iridescent dust. It was like a fog. It was like a, imagine a fog and every single particle, every single water molecule is a different color. It was iridescent. They started flapping their wings and then suddenly they came pop, 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 and sound like a helicopter. Just whoop, 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 whoop with those wings. And then suddenly the whole thing burst into flame and they were just completely covered with a ball of fire. Yeah, uh, You know, two on this side and, and on the others. And I saw them lift up the flooring around the throne platform and put the flooring on their shoulders and the father said, I'll be back. And he went, and he banked away like an airplane banks away. And I was sitting there kind of like, okay, what do I do now? And I thought, okay, he's everywhere by the Holy Spirit. He's seated on a throne. Revelation 4, he's on the throne. Ezekiel 1, he's on the throne. Daniel 7, he's on the throne. But he's everywhere through the Holy Spirit, through his mind, through his soul and emotions. And so I continued to worship. And what seemed like half an hour later, he came back and settled down the cherub's Wings slowed down and the fire stopped. And and he looked at me and he said, I told you I'd be back. So anyway, that's in a nutshell, that was uh, the wow. first the, the parts I'm willing to share anyway. That is incredible. Thank you for sharing. Wow, John. So was it shortly after that when you came back, uh, were you still on the floor and the sanctuary? What was that like coming back? Yeah, it was it was instant. It was an instant thing. There wasn't any flying through space, holding onto the hand of the angel or anything else. It was just over. I don't mm -hmm. I don't know how to describe it. And I was like, I was like, 
what just happened? And and on Earth, I think only between 20 and 40 minutes went by. I, I'm using a little guesswork there because uh, just because I didn't look at my watch, you know, when I saw the angel's hand. Hmm. But I knew it was like during a lunch hour type thing. It was, so it seemed like 20 to 40 minutes. But in heaven, it was like hours. I mean, hours went by. Mm. There was no rush. There was no urgency. There was just here, I'm giving you this tour. And, you know, all the different, it just was so completely normal. So it's it, it's part of that, uh, you know, Jesus is the I am. He truly is above and beyond time and can move independently of it. And yes. that realm just doesn't have a stopwatch. The Lord can drop something in your spirit and it's volumes. Yeah. It's the same type of thing, you know, so much can be dropped in you by the Holy Spirit just all at once that will take you a month or two to think through. But it happens. How, did you tell people right away? How did you feel after coming back? Actually, it took me, I, I you know, I, I would say something to Barb, to my wife, and to people I could trust here and there. But there were there were also things said that were private. It was kind of like what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, that he wor- heard words that's not lawful to utter. There are things that are that are said that are just between me and the Lord or me and the Father that will always be. So the first impression is for me is the personal nature of it, of how private it is. And so it took a while for me to talk about it. Um you know, I don't, I don't have, it's not in my heart. Self-promotion is really not in my heart. And I take my walk with the Lord very, very seriously. And so, you know, I hit the highlights maybe where I'm comfortable sharing. And beyond that, it's, it, it's, it's hard to describe the, the, the accountability. I know people say, oh, I wish Jesus would appear to me. You know, I, you could solve my problems and answer questions. It's like, no, you don't. Because because you've seen too much. You know, there's a scripture in the Old Testament. It's in 2 Kings. I'm trying to think where it is, where the Lord was angry with Solomon because Solomon had gone astray from him. And it specifically says, because he had appeared to him twice. The Lord was disappointed because he was he had appeared to him twice. And still Solomon went after the other gods and goddesses. And mm-hmm. so there is this expectation that for me anyway, I've seen the Lord not once, but multiple times. He comes to me a few times a year. And that's part of my call. I realize that. But there's also that seriousness to it that, that uh, you know, you realize he's God, you're not. So any sense of, hey, you know, I went to heaven last week or, you know, it, 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 if somebody says they went to heaven at will, number one, they're off because every example in scripture of a spiritual experience, heaven initiates. And these are very special, and it's, they're not toys. They're given for the edification of the body of Christ. And, and so I, take it, I just take it real seriously. And I think part of that protectiveness is why the Lord continues to entrust me with prophetic words and, and things of that nature. I uh, believe that as well for future. you. Yeah. But it's, <laughs> I, feel like the, the, I feel like when I was first born again, the highway of grace was an eight-lane superhighway with rubber guardrails on the side. And I feel like now I know too much and I'm more like walking a knife edge mm. with a thousand foot drop on either side. And it's not a fear thing. It's just a sense of responsibility. So I yeah. share things not to, and people can think what they want. I really don't care because on that last day, Jesus is going to acknowledge me before the father. Yes. And um, so it took a while. And even today, I, you know, like the Lord will say different things to me and I, I may not, I may or may not share them. And so. If I could say, if I could say one thing, and I know we've gone on a little bit. Yes, please. Um, you know, my oldest son is handicapped, and I, I just want to speak to those who have special needs kids. Uh, my son, right now, as we're recording this, is forty-three, but because of the cord around his neck and the slip knot cutting off oxygen, he's four years old. So we've had about forty years of a mental four-year-old, and he was at home for the first twenty-four years, but he's he's uh, been in a group home the last twenty. And, and just share this. Chris is a funny guy. He, he, and he has been, he came kind of army man crawling down the hallway one day when he was 21. And he said, dad, dad, he said, know what Jesus said to me? 
I said, what, Chris? I said, what did he say? Jesus said, he's going to walk through the mountains with me. Yep, that's what he said. All right. He's going to walk through the mountains with me. Yoo-hoo, isn't that great? He's going to walk through the mountains with me. So my son is geared towards heaven. He's not geared towards healing. He's he's looked at kids, you know, running on or playing bikes or on the bicycles or whatever. He says, when I get to heaven, I'm going to run like that. And a few months ago, about earlier in this summer, I was a little bit on the pity party side of just saying, Lord, you know, how long? Um, you know, biostrepsy was healed and, and everything else, but uh, but I get I'm playing the same playlist, you know, that Chris loves to hear, the Donut Man and Salty the Singing Songbook and Veggie Tales and and all of those. And I said, I long to know my son as as the adult that he is, the 43-year-old that he is. The man, you know, what he could be if his legs were normal, you know, he'd be as tall as me. He's got his mom's good looks and brunette hair color and handsome young man. I I just long to know him. And suddenly before me, there was a like a screen and I was standing and I knew I was standing right next to Chris's left shoulder and he was seated. And I was looking down at the top of his head and I realized his head's larger, like normal size. It's slightly small now. And and he was a normal guy. His legs were normal, filled out. I could just see that from standing next to him, kind of looking down. And there were people scattered around, sitting on the ground, uh, listening to him. And he was like on a rock or something, and, and he was just talking. And I said, Father, what am I seeing? And he said, you're seeing Chris in heaven. And I said, well, what's he doing? And he said, he's sharing with others what it was like to live in a handicapped body and to be mentally handicapped and disabled. He's sharing his perspective of some of the times he tried to communicate but couldn't. And I recognized in the crowd some of his caregivers that I know from the group home who are Christians. I recognized some of it in the crowd, and they're recognizing the times and the events that Chris was was telling them. And I didn't hear what he was telling them. I just saw the acknowledgement of them shaking their heads. And so I just want to say this for anybody out there who, who knows someone who's special needs, or you have a, a child or or a loved one, or maybe even someone older, maybe someone's had a stroke and they can't communicate. Just know that that time will be restored, that this time, this time on earth is like a vapor. And there will come that time you will get to know them uh, unhindered by the frailties of the human body and the diseases and the injuries that can cause uh, mm. so much disruption. So I just I just want to share that well, with folks and um, and maybe pray, you know, just. Yes, I, it's perfect. Thank you so much for sharing that. I know somebody needed to hear that. So why don't we why don't you go ahead and pray us out on that note? Yeah. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time together. Uh, Father, you know, I always pray, Ephesians 1, you know, 17 through 19, that you would give everybody the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you, that you would open the eyes of everyone's understanding, all of us, to know the hope and the call of the call of the invitation that we have in you. Just give us spiritual wisdom, spiritual understanding by your spirit. Thank you for doing that, Father. And I pray that you'll touch hearts with uh, everything that was said. Just personalize it as needed. And uh, thank you for your blessing and your presence so tangibly felt right now. Thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.